Welcome to the Cancer Research Institute's Cancer Immunotherapy and You webinar series. Today's date is Friday, May 18th, 2018, and the title for today's webinar is Infecting Cancer, How Viruses Are Turning the Tide Against Tumors. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who have made this webinar series possible. That includes Bristol-Myers Squibb, along with additional support from Regeneron, Sanofi Genzyme, and adapt immune. My name is Brian Brewer and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute, a nonprofit organization established 65 years ago with the singular mission to save more lives by fueling research on the immune system and applying that knowledge to developing new treatments that harness the immune system's power to attack all cancers. This work has contributed to the development of many life-saving immunotherapies for a variety of cancer types some of which have already been approved in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere to treat a variety of cancers. We present this webinar series to patients and caregivers to help them understand what immunotherapy is and how it's different from other can uh, cancer treatments, to provide information on the latest developments in research and treatment, and to connect patients to cancer immunotherapy clinical trials. Our website at cancerresearch.org features these and other resources for patients and caregivers as part of Cancer Research Institute's Answer to Cancer educational programs. Here you can read or watch stories from members of our immuno community who have been treated with immunotherapy. We also have this webinar series. Uh, we are hosting an immunotherapy patient summit series, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a second. And we have a clinical trial finder where you can be matched with a clinical trial navigator to a trial for which you might be eligible and for which you can discuss with your oncologist. Uh, this June marks our sixth annual Cancer Immunotherapy Month. This is our awareness building and fundraising campaign. Throughout the entire month, we'll be sharing discoveries from CRI-funded scientists. We'll also be covering the latest news from ASCO, the world's largest oncology conference uh, that patients need to know. We will show four new video stories of patients treated with different types of immunotherapy. We'll be celebrating Cancer Survivors Day on June 3rd. We will also convene a, a panel of experts at ASCO to share their uh, insights into the news coming out of ASCO. And then on June 15th, we have Wear White Day where we encourage you to show your support and stand, stand with science and support for immunotherapy by wearing white and uploading a picture of yourself uh, to social media using the hashtag Wear white. You can learn about these and more activities at cancerresearch.org forward slash June. I mentioned we have our Immunotherapy Patient Summit series. Uh, this year we will be hosting summits in San Francisco, New York, San Diego, and Houston. The dates are here on the screen. These are half-day events where patients and caregivers can connect with immunotherapy experts and with one another, as well as meet with a one-on-one -on -one clinical trial navigator. Uh, you can learn more at cancerresearch.org forward slash summit. These are uh, free of charge to attend. We will also be live streaming the New York uh, summit. So if you're unable to attend in person, you can participate online. All right, with that, now it's my pleasure to introduce our very patient uh, expert, Dr. John C. Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell is director of the Ontario Regional Biotherapeutics Program at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. He's a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Biochemistry, Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Ottawa, and the director of the Canadian Oncolytic Virus Consortium. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and is currently funded with the Cancer Research Institute Clinic and Laboratory Integration Grant. Dr. Bell has also participated and chaired panels for several research granting agencies and has been a member of the Canadian Cancer Society Board of Directors. His lab specializes in discovering and designing new th therapeutic viruses known as oncolytic viruses, which can selectively infect and kill cancer cells while leaving healthy cells and tissues unharmed. In addition, he has led efforts to translate oncolytic virus approaches to the clinic, where these strategies have begun to show great benefit for patients with diverse types of cancer. Dr. Bell, it's an honor to have you here with us today. Well, thanks Thank very much. much. So, so um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to actually get a chance to speak with you because uh, I, I think it's really important for people to understand where their money goes when they make donations to organizations like the CRI. 
And, and I really feel a responsibility to tell you how exciting things are, how the changes that are being made in the cancer research field are impacting patients. So I'm really happy to have a chance to speak with all of you today. I think the first question, which I often have to uh, discuss with people, is, you know, wh where do cancers come from? Because uh, they're not like an infection per se. They're not like uh, getting a cold. These are actually diseases that arise in our own body as a result uh, of alterations to our own genetic information. And that really makes it very challenging to try to find a single therapy that's going to actually deal with the disease because everybody's cancer is going to be somewhat unique. So we all have DNA in every one of the cells in our body, which is our genetic information. It's our blueprint of our body and of, of, of everything that we are. Uh, and, and that's really where cancers arise, unfortunately. Uh, we get what are called mutations uh, that can happen in your genetic information. And, and that can change the, the, the kind of genetic information that you now have in, in an individual cell in your body. So if, if we just take a look at this cartoon here as an example. So we are made up really of billions and billions of cells. We have billions of skin cells. We have billions of blood cells in our body. And what's really interesting and what we've learned over the years as a result of the, of the research that many labs around the world have been doing is that each of the cells in our body has the genetic information to make essentially another person. Each of the cells in our body is genetically regulated to know when it's time to grow and when it's time to die. And so we have genes that control the growth of individual cells. So if you look in this picture here, this is an individual cell. Let's pretend it's your skin cell. Inside it is your genetic information. And, and this cell knows every day when it's supposed to, to duplicate itself and make a sister cell. And it knows every day when it's supposed to also, uh, individual cells are supposed to stop growing and sometimes die, destroy themselves and go away. So with this beautiful symphony that's happening inside our bodies at all times, regulated growth and regulated death all genetically controlled. But unfortunately, especially if you live for a long time, and, does, and cancer tends to be a disease of older people, although certainly young people can unfortunately get it too, over time you can have events uh, which are causing damage to our genetic information in individual cells. So for instance, we know we are humans, we, we do things we probably shouldn't do, we smoke and we shouldn't, we uh, maybe go to tanning parlors when we shouldn't, we live in big cities like I live in where there's you know, pollution from cars. These are all things which can cause damage to your genetic information. But I'd also say that aside from those things which are so-called mutagenic, the reality is if you're duplicating your genetic information every single day, billions of times, over your lifetime, as you get to live to a long time, the chances you might make a mistake in copying your DNA are pretty high. So something I'd call just bad luck can also happen, and it's probably a major contributor uh, to cancer. Unfortunately, sometimes just errors that your cells make as they replicate themselves over your lifetime can lead to mutations, and those can lead to cancer. So in the case of this cell, for instance, it gets a mutation from whatever reason, bad luck or uh, a mutagen exposed in, to in our environment, it now has a mutation in its cell death gene. It forgets how to die. It's sort of weird, but it has genes that still say your time to grow, but you, it's you've forgotten how to die. And so let's pretend that cell is now this red cell, in every way, it looks just like a sister cell, the blue cell, except it's lost the ability to know when to die. It basically, it basically becomes immortal, and, and it grows and grows forever. And in fact, in cells, I have cells in my lab, as every scientist around the world has, that are derived originally from a, a woman in, in the United States back in the 50s, Henrietta Lacks, who many people have, have probably read about her, who had cervical cancer and died. And her cells are still growing in our lab. They're immortalized, and they will grow forever. It's because they've had a mutation in some genetic information. So that really is an important understanding because you, you now realize these cells and these cells are very, very similar. The only way to tell them apart uh, is by things like their changes in growth and their immortality. And that makes it very challenging to sort of develop a pill that could, could help you to treat this, this, this kind of disease. So what's interesting is, is I want to speak a little bit about viruses. Okay, so viruses, um, it's just sort of to bring this all together eventually, viruses are parasites that live in our environment. We actually are exposed to viruses hundreds of times every single day. There's probably a million different kinds of viruses that live in the environment, in the world that we live in. Uh, and, and these viruses can sometimes enter into your cells, and through their replication, through their growth, they can find ways to, to disrupt your genetic information. They can be essentially mutagens, just like uh, UV rays, radiation, or smoking. 
uh, in some cases. Now, these are actually quite rare cases, but unfortunately, when that happens, it can lead to a disease like cancer. And so if this virus, which is, uh, again, just to, to speak a little bit about viruses, they are on their own cannot replicate and grow. They are parasites. They can only grow by entering into other cells and using those cells and using the genetic information of those cells to, to reproduce themselves. So if you have a virus, which is a parasite, some classes of viruses, some kinds will enter into your cell and they'll actually integrate or, or, or cut and paste their DNA into the DNA of the person they've infected. And that can lead to a mutation. So if this virus, and the example we're probably going to speak about mostly is human papillomavirus, which is a well-known virus now, uh, enters into a cell, it uncoats its DNA, and it uses that DNA then to inter integrate or insert itself into the genetic information of the person who's infected. And that insertion event can sometimes lead to uh, the growth of a cancer because the the DNA has gone in and interrupted the DNA of the patient, but also in some cases there are virus genes that get expressed in the setting that lead to, the, to cancer to happen. So sometimes viruses can be dangerous. Uh, we all know about Ebola virus, for instance, and, and of course this one I'm referring to as, as human papillomavirus and AIDS virus. These are all dangerous viruses. Uh, and so we have to understand how they work so that we can use them to our advantage to make therapeutics. So this, again, is a picture of the human papillomavirus. These are very simple creatures. They have very limited genetic information, and as I mentioned, cannot reproduce on their own. They really have to uh, parasitize a cell and get inside a cell in order to use the cell's genetic information to copy themselves. They're actually very physically small as well. This is a picture of a human papillomavirus, but it actually cannot be visualized with light. You have to use electron beams to see it. So these are very small, genetically simple, and very small, but highly evolved uh, parasites that can sometimes cause very bad diseases uh, like head and neck cancers or cervical cancer, uh, whereas hepatitis, and again, hepatitis B is another virus like this. It's been linked to liver cancer. Uh, and certainly there's many other kinds of, of virus-associated cancers like AIDS, for instance. Um, but the good news about this, there's a, this is all bad stuff, of course, but the good news about it is now that we know these things can cause cancer, it's possible to, to eliminate them by vaccination. And, you know, we all go to the doctor every year. We get vaccinated for one of kids for things like uh, measles, mumps, and rubella, and chickenpox, and so on. Well, now there's a, a vaccine available for human papillomavirus, which would be really great if we could get this widely used in, in, in the world, throughout the world, because it would eliminate this cancer-causing virus and, and never let it cause cancer again. And we, we know this would be a really powerful way to prevent cancer. So, you know, our understanding of how cancers and viruses interact together is really important. Uh, and it's allowed us to find ways to make, for instance, in this case, preventive vaccines that could, cop could essentially eliminate cervical cancer from the face of the earth if it was properly used around the world. Um, the other thing that's, that's interesting about it is because these are foreign entities, uh, our immune systems can recognize them. And so we can take advantage of the fact that a cancer may be caused by a virus to develop strategies to therapeutically attack that cancer. And I'll speak a bit more about that in a minute. So up to now, viruses can be bad in some cases. Uh, but there's, the good news is we can actually stop them from being bad by, by developing vaccines. And that's a huge effort that's going on around the world. And certainly the HPV vaccine is, is now very effective and there's a couple different versions of it. And I'd encourage everybody to have their, their children vaccinated if they could because we can eliminate cancers uh, of the cervix very easily by doing this. But not all viruses are bad. In fact, as I mentioned, there's millions of viruses around the world. If you go swim in the ocean, there's millions of viruses that are in the ocean at all times. Uh, really, per, per mill of water, it's, a, it's astounding number of virus particles that are out there of all different kinds. And these viruses are as different as, as dogs and cats and, and horses. They're all very, very genetically different and very, very interesting. So there are some bad viruses, uh, but there's a lot of viruses which we'd call benign or really don't cause any disease in humans. And our idea is, can we use those viruses in some way as therapeutics? Can we use them to be parasites instead of normal cells, make them to be parasites of cancer cells? So can you imagine that if you had a virus that was a parasite of a cancer cell, you could infect someone with it, it could go all over the body looking for a, a, a cell to infect, and the only one it would grow in would be a cancer cell. And this could be a very uh, important kind of therapeutic because, as I mentioned, cancer cells and normal cells look very, very similar, but a virus might be able to differentiate them 
and you might be able to make a therapeutic that's very specific for the cancer and not have any off-target effects. And that's certainly the, the field of so-called oncolytic viruses that I've been immersed in for many years, and many of my colleagues around the world have, have done some great things. And I'm going to speak a little bit about how that all works. So if we get back to this again, remember, as I said earlier, cancer cells are genetically very similar to normal cells, and they physically look very similar, hard to tell them apart, except that what we discovered many years ago is that when a cell loses its growth control, when it becomes immortalized, in order to do that, it has to throw away some genetic information or mutate some genetic information. And what we found was the same genes that make a cell become immortalized, allow it to grow forever, those same genes were also normally involved in having an individual cell fight virus invasion. Okay, So now this red cell and the blue cell are different in that the red cell is immortal, but it's also different in that it has lost its ability to resist infection of viruses. So we have a very complex, well-evolved structure, a set of programs in all of our cells in our body that are dedicated towards resisting virus infection. As I mentioned, we're exposed to viruses every single day. And so we've evolved very sophisticated pathways to block viruses from from entering or once they get inside a cell, shutting them down. But those defenses are lost in cancer cells. And that means it's, in principle, possible to create a virus, which is a parasite, that can only infect the red cells and never infect the blue cells. And that's where a so-called oncolytic or cancer-lysing viruses. The thing that's really interesting, and, and, and so when we first started designing these uh, many years ago, and it's actually a, a really interesting field of of research that's been done by many scientists around the world uh, from uh, the UK and Europe and United States, Canada and, and in Asia now, uh, people were really designed these viruses to be specific so they'd infect the cancer cell and blow it up and destroy it. But what we released is what we re realized over time was not only did they just infect and kill these cells, but at the same time when they did this, they caused the cells to sort of release what are called antigens or molecules that can awaken the immune system. So really what's interesting about cancers uh, in a diabolical sort of way is that cancers live in our body and they find ways to suppress our immune system so that they, those red cells cannot be recognized by the immune system. They essentially cloak themselves. They sort of make the immune system think there's nothing there that's important. When the virus comes in though, it infects that cell. This red cell is now infected and it wants to get the immune system over there to help save it from infection. It actually sends out signals saying, hey, come over here. And, and stop this virus from spreading. But once the immune system gets in there and sees that there is an infected red cell, it also notices that these red cells shouldn't be there, that they are actually themselves cancers. And so the active infection reawakens the immune system to recognize these cancers as foreign. And so really the infection by the virus not only attacks the cancer and destroys it, but also awakens the patient's immune system to recognize this cancer as foreign and therefore enable the immune system to attack the cancer. It really stimulates uh, an adaptive immune response is what we call it, where the immune system begins to recognize these as foreign. And the interesting thing about that is the immune system is mobile. It can move throughout your body and it can really generate a systemic immune response. So even if you have metastatic disease throughout your body, in principle, initiating this event at one site in your body can lead to an immune response that can be systemic and can attack cancer anywhere in your body. The, the interesting thing about viruses that, that we, we've done and many groups have done is really think about these viruses as little genetic machines, little biological machines that we can manipulate. Since we understand their genetic information very well, we can actually remove genes that make this virus, for instance, a pathogen. So, for instance, you might want to use uh, a flu virus. And some people have done this. They've taken a flu virus, which normally causes the flu, removed some genes, and that virus no longer can cause the flu because it's become attenuated. But then you might add in other genes that make that virus so they can specifically infect cancer cells or may actually express genes which help to more robustly stimulate the immune system. So really we can engineer, we can genetically engineer these viruses, we can turn them into little machines that are now able to go throughout the body, find cancers, infect them, produce immune stimulating genes like the kinds that are being developed by the CRI, and really attract the immune system in to begin to attack the cancer and destroy it. One of the first viruses, or the first virus that was approved for this use is a so-called emlogic virus, 
This is the trade name for it. But this was developed by a, a scientist named Rob Coffin back when he was in the UK originally. Uh, and then it subsequently moved to, to the United States and formed a company called Biobex that was ultimately acquired by a company called Amgen. And this is an uh, interesting virus. It's actually a, a version of the herpes virus. And so when you hear herpes, you think, oh, I don't want to get herpes virus. But again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can take things out of that virus so it's no longer a herpes virus. You've attenuated it. You've changed it so it can really only grow in cancer cells and nowhere else. And so that's what Rob and his group did, is they, they changed the virus, so-called TVEC or Imlijic, as I mentioned. They made it so the only place it could grow was, in fact, uh, inside cancer cells. And they also added to it a transgene. In this case, it's called GMCSF. This is just a, a like an immune hormone type of molecule that can be secreted from the infected cell and then attract the immune system to see that this cancer cell shouldn't be there and activate the immune system to attack it. So this is really an example of, of taking a, a virus, a, a known virus, which in some cases it, this, this virus could cause some disease in humans, mild disease, the so-called, uh, because it's a herpes simplex virus, but then engineering it, taking out the genes which made it virulent and adding in genes which make it stimulate the immune system. And this virus has been shown in, in a clinical study, a uh, randomized clinical study, to have impact uh, on melanoma cells, and it's been approved for use in metastatic melanoma. Uh, the, the thing is, and this was a great demonstration, the whole field was really excited about this because it actually demonstrated for the first time, and we were able to get approved by the FDA, that viruses could be drugs, they could be therapeutics. And now there is a really explosion of, of excitement in this field, and lots of different kinds of viruses are being tested uh, to, to attack cancer. And it, as I mentioned, cancers are very unique to each individual. So as a result of changes in their, in their genetic information. And so it's going to be unlikely that we're going to find one virus that's going to treat all cancers. It's more likely that we're going to find a small number of viruses that can be used for different kinds of cancers from different kinds of people. And so people are exploring different platforms, as we call them. The adenovirus is one which is a, actually causes the common cold in people. I've mentioned the herpes simplex that was modified uh, by, by Rob Coffin. Measles virus, which is being used, uh, developed in many places around the world, in Germany, but also primarily at the Mayo Clinic by uh, Stephen Russell. He was one of the first people to do this. The Maraba virus is one that we've been working on in, in Canada for many years, as is vaccinia virus. This is a small sandfly virus. Uh, so it was originally isolated from sandflies in Brazil. Vaccinia is a, a virus which has been used for hundreds of years to help prevent uh, the spread of smallpox. And vesicular stomatitis virus is another uh, virus that has been developed uh, by groups around the world, including at the Mayo Clinic. And there's many others, actually, that are, that are out there now being tested. And the idea here is really to understand the biology of the virus, how it interacts with particular cells, how the genetic defects in particular patients may make a virus better or worse for that kind of cancer, and then modify them to make them very potent immune stimulatory uh, kinds of therapeutics. So just to give you an example of some of the work that's going on, this is a trial that, uh, that we're running uh, through a company called Stern Turnstone Biologics, but it was really originally developed uh, in my lab and the lab of Dave Stoidel and the lab of Brian Lichty, uh, both uh, investigators here in Canada at different universities. Uh, and we've created a virus which not only stimulates the immune system by infecting the tumor, but it also expresses a particular molecule. In this case, it's called MAJ3. It's a so-called tumor antigen. And so we're, we're using the virus to both stimulate, to, to both attack the cancer and destroy it, but at the same time specifically uh, engage the immune system of the patient to attack cells that express MAGE A3, which is often found on particular kinds of cancer cells. And so this trial is ongoing now in Canada, as is this one, it's soon to open up in, in the United States as well, in which we're combining the virus now with a so-called checkpoint inhibitor, which many of you have probably heard about. This is an antibody which can then stimulate the immune system to be even more active. So the concept here, you use the virus to make the immune system see the tumor and begin to develop an immune response and then add another immune modulator like a checkpoint inhibitor to enable that immune response to be even more effective and persistent. And so really the, the jargon that people use is we say the virus is infecting the tumor, which is normally immunologically cold. Normally it's hidden from the immune system and we're heating that tumor up so that now it's inflamed. Now the immune system is able to enter the tumor and we're able to generate a good immune response. And then by using things like checkpoint inhibitors, we can take that immune response and potentiate it and make it even more and more effective. 
So really, I think the future of oncolytic viruses, as is the case for many immuno immunotherapeutics, is to use them in thoughtful combinations so that we do things biologically that make sense. In one sense, generate an immune response to the virus, adding a checkpoint to potentiate it, make it last longer. So right now, there's a lot of work uh, going on, as I mentioned, in the field. Uh, we're looking at various kinds of ways to make the viruses better. It's still, a, it's still actually a fairly uh, new field. It's really only been, although this concept's been around for many, many years, it's really only been developed over the last 20 years to really get an understanding of how viruses and cells interact. And so we're still un uncovering many of the basic insights that, that allow us to figure out how to make the virus a better biological machine, how to make it a better a biological machine that can go throughout your body, find cancer cells, infect them, and destroy them. And at the same time, we're saying, how does the virus and the tumor and the immune system interact? And so can we design rational combinations, like I mentioned the immune checkpoint combination? Can we add in, for instance, uh, currently used uh, th therapeutics in the cancer field of chemotherapy, for instance, can we combine that with a virus in a rational way? There's lots of different ways that you can imagine using these viruses to attack the cancer and program the immune system and use them with existing therapies, like, for instance, radiation therapy as well. And so a lot of this is going on now. A lot of work's being done um, in, in the mouse models, but also a lot of clinical studies have now opened, and we're beginning to test this in patients to try to find the best approaches to, to make it an effective therapy. And as it says here, you know, one of the things we really need to understand better is, is which patients are most likely to respond to which virus? And, and when do we stop treating and when do we uh, combine with other kinds of therapies? So there's a lot of work ongoing as well to try to understand why patients respond and what we can do to make them respond better. So really that's, I, I think, is the future of this whole field is really a better understanding of the fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, um, uh, science of the, sci of the virus-host interaction, how to exploit that to make it more effective, and how to understand how the viruses, cancer cells, and the immune system all interact so we can begin to really make strategic, uh, promising therapeutic approaches that will help a lot of, pe a lot of people. So I think I'll just, uh, I'll just end there, Brian. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much for that. That was uh, actually very exciting for me. Um, I always have asked and have been asked by folks, um, how is it that viruses are able to selectively attack cancer and not healthy cells. And your description of uh, the trade-off cancer cells make, that they, uh, in order to mutate to become immortal, they have to give up their ability to defend themselves against uh, viral infection. So that's, that's really eye-opening, and I, and I want to thank you for that. Um, are there any particular side effects that can be associated with oncolytic virus therapy? No, Brian, that's a that's a great question. Great question. And I think, I think uh, you know, in the studies we've done so far, uh, what's really exciting is that the viruses are very selective. They only infect a tumor cell, not normal tissues, and so we don't really see a lot of side effects. The first day the patients get treated, they get flu-like symptoms. So they often get a fever, they may get uh, nausea, uh, but that usually settles down in a day or so, and then after that there really are no other side effects. So it's a really exciting aspect of these kinds of therapeutics. That's fantastic. Um, if, if a patient, let's say a patient's already infected with one of the viruses that you're using in the oncolytic virus therapy, are they still eligible to receive that therapy? Uh, another great question. Uh, and it's something that, to be honest, we're still working through in, in this space. Uh, so we know that some of the viruses, as you heard I mentioned, are ones that people already have acquired, uh, in fact, have already been infected by, as you mentioned, may already have an immune response against it. So you think we'll be able to use this as a therapeutic. We think we still can, because you can give the virus by direct injection of the tumor in some cases, and get around that neutralizing antibody response people might have. And the other thing is, when we use these viruses as therapeutics, we grow them to extremely high concentrations. And we believe we can dose over the pre-existing immune response that patients may have and still allow the virus to get to the tumor. Because these viruses are so highly selected to only infect cancer cells, it's possible to give very high doses and allow them to get past immune responses and infect the tumor they need to get to. That's good to know. Uh, you mentioned uh, biomarkers, and uh, biomarkers are an intense area of study right now. Uh, because we do want to predict which patients are likely to respond to any type of immunotherapy or not. 
Are there specific biomarkers you're looking at in the oncolytic virus therapy field? Yes, yes. It's, it's a good question again. Uh, we know that some of these viruses recognize cells by the particular molecules they express in their surface. So in some cases, we can say, does this person's patient, does this patient's tumor have that protein on the surface? And if they don't, we wouldn't give them that virus. So that's one way we're doing it. But we're also understanding how defective the tumor may be in its ability to respond to virus infection. And those are some of the markers we're looking at to see who's more likely to respond to virus infection and who's not. Okay. Um, you, you talked about your lab work, and obviously there's a lot of research that you and, and many others are doing in this field. Um, how how important is, or how does how does how do you translate what you're learning in the lab into treatments that can potentially help patients? So, you know, for years I've been treating mice. You know, I'm a mouse doctor, and that, that's really unsatisfying because I don't really care about mice. And and the the good thing is it's a place to start. But what you really need to do is move your therapies into patients. And that's really the only place we'll learn all the important things we need to learn. An immune system of a mouse and the immune system of a patient are quite different. So we could modify the virus and make it very effective in a mouse, and it may not work in a person. So really what we're in, we're in a place now, it's called translational research, where we need to translate our discoveries into clinical studies. And clinical studies are very important because they allow us not only to give patients an opportunity to benefit from a new therapy, but in each clinical study that we do, we try to learn as much as we possibly can so we can actually improve the therapeutics and make them more effective for the next patient. So I have a ton of respect for the people who go on clinical studies. I know many of them go on there because uh, they're hoping for something that will, will, will uh, benefit them, as we all do. But they also all say to me when they go on our trials, this may not work for me, but I know you're going to learn something from it, and it will help my son and my grandson. And I think that's really... Uh, speaks to the, you know, the, the courage of these people, and it's playing such a vital role for us to be able to understand how to make these therapeutics better. The nice thing, Brian, about the virus platform that I'm excited about is since we can genetically manipulate them so quickly, information we learn from even a few patients can allow us to retool them very quickly and get a better product for the next patient. So it's really critical for us to translate discoveries from the mouse and into people as quickly as possible, and we do that through clinical studies. You you mentioned, or I mentioned, that you are currently receiving a clinic laboratory integration program grant from Cancer Research Institute. How is that grant helping to support your research efforts? Uh, it was great to get that grant. I'll tell you the nicest thing about it was that it allowed me to work with a colleague in the United Kingdom, Ellen Melcher, uh, so this is a, I'm a Canadian, and, and so this grant is helping this Canadian lab work with a, a British lab together to really improve the virus that we're working on so we understand better how to stimulate anti-tumor immunity. So it was a great uh, opportunity to allow us to interact in a very collaborative fashion. And, you know, two heads are better than one, but I think in this case it's even better than that because we have all our groups working together as well to, to really understand how the virus works with the immune system and how we can make it a better therapeutic. All right. We just have time for a couple more questions. Um, you mentioned melanoma as one of the cancers that are uh, under study, and actually there's an approved oncolytic virus therapy to treat melanoma. Are there other cancer types that, are, that either are more favorable or likely to, to respond more favorably than other types of cancer? And where are the, where are the real hot pockets of, of research happening in terms of cancer types? Um, well, I think that uh, there's a lot of, interestingly, there's a lot of activity um, in the oncovirus world in, in trying to, to uh, develop something for, for brain cancers. And, and there's certainly groups at Duke, which have led the way with a, a modified polio virus, uh, groups in Texas, which have looked at an adenovirus for this purpose, uh, and groups uh, in, in the West Coast uh, who have looked at a virus uh, that's based upon actually a, a, what's called a retrovirus. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of activity there and a lot of excitement because it looks like potentially there could be some, some good outcomes with that approach. Another area that I think is really exciting is, you know, we talked, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, about HPV, it's a virus which causes cancer. 
And one of the things we recognized early on was since that virus causes cancer, it has to be a virus that can enter into a cancer cell and, and really create an environment where viruses can thrive. And so in a way, cancers caused by HPV, like cervical cancer and head and neck cancer, are great candidates for virus therapy because they've already been groomed, as it were, by a virus, and now a second virus can come in and attack them. They also express virus proteins, which are very foreign, and that can help to stimulate the immune system to recognize them as, as foreign as well. So we're working on a, a, a study which has now been approved to go forward in the United States uh, through the FDA and in Canada using, again, a combination of oncolytic viruses to attack HPV cancers like head and neck and cervical. And I think that's going to be a really interesting opportunity to, to see something really uh, exciting on the field. There's also a group in the U.K. working on colon cancer, uh, a company called Cyoxis that is really led by Lynn Seymour and, and, and Carrie Fisher at Oxford University, uh, who really developed a virus that specifically is targeted to colon cancer cells. So I think there's a lot of things like these going on around the world now. Uh, and as I mentioned, it isn't going to be one virus, it's gonna be, but it's not going to be 100 viruses. It's going to be like 10 viruses, I'm guessing, that will be able to address many of the kinds of cancers that, that people suffer from. Where, where can patients get access to oncolytic virus therapy? You know, the, the place I'd advise most is through clinicaltrials.gov because that's where, uh, you know, you can use a search engine there, you can put in oncolytic virus immunotherapy, and you can find trials in the United States or anywhere in the world uh, where people are testing this concept. So that's the most legitimate place to go, I'd say, in, in terms of trying to find uh, uh, places to, to get uh, virus therapy. All right. Well, that, that then uh, ties in very nicely to our clinical trial finder, which is based on the clinicaltrials.gov database, but uh, which is specifically focused on immunotherapy. And we have the clinical trial navigators that can talk you through identifying oncolytic virus therapies. Um, so thanks. I, 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 that's great to hear um, and, and probably also great that these are happening all around the world. Yeah. Uh, since we know cancer affects everyone. Mm -hmm. All right, that is all the time we have. Um, I just want to thank our sponsors again for making this webinar series possible, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Regeneron, Sanofi Genzyme, and Adapt Immune. This and other webinars that we've done as part of our Cancer Immunotherapy and New Webinar Series are all available for free download and viewing at cancerresearch.org forward slash webinars. So if there's a particular cancer type that you're interested in learning about what immunotherapy options are available, uh, we're sure to have a webinar about it on that website. So do please check that out. Dr. Bell, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, thank you for the excellent work you're doing uh, to help patients. And um, I, I wish you the very best. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. You got it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.